So right now I'm a um, Trinitarian Christian, um, currently going to a, um... can you hear me? Yeah, I'm waiting. Oh, I'm currently going to a um, Protestant church, non-denominational, but I'm, I'm in a, aspiring to be an Orthodox. Good. All right. Anyway. Um, I do my, my biggest objection, not objection, but the hardest thing to overcome is the, um, the saints. The praying to the saints and uh, venerating the saints. Why? When I've answered that five months. I, I, yeah, no, I've watched all your sessions and I and I find it to be uh, biblical. Um, What's the problem? The problem is for me. This is just a, oh. something I need to get my mind wrapped around. Mm -hmm. um, as Christians, we're supposed to be, you know, calling these, you know, others to Christ. And um, so what about it? Um, I feel like, oh no, no, well. Most of the other people that don't know Christ are going to be pagans and worshiping other gods. So where's that line? Um, I know veneration is not worship. Yeah, I don't understand what's the connection because the pagans also would pray and offer sacrifices. That means when the Jews were praying and offering sacrifices, they shouldn't have done that because it's it smacks too much of paganism. Mm. No, and not, not temples. Yeah, to where gods and goddesses. So when God had them fashion a temple was that being too much like the pagans what no, is it no, no, no. just because pagans may have practices that are not identical to us but similar enough that you think where you draw the line you draw the line is because they believe these were gods and goddesses who had to mm -hmm. be appeased. so you yeah. believe peter is a god no 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 you believe mary is a goddess no so there is no moral equivalence mm, i see i see when that makes sense pagan called I can hear myself through your thing. When the pagans fall on Ishtar, they believe she was a goddess. When Christians ask the Blessed Mother to pray, they don't believe she's a goddess. They believe she's a creature, a human creature, nothing more than a human creature, who's nothing without Jesus Christ. She is what she is only because of Jesus Christ. When pagans call on Hermes or Dionysus, they believe these are gods. When people who are believers who love Jesus ask St. Peter to pray, they believe he's a human creature, not a god. So there is no equivalence. I see. That makes sense. Um, can I ask one more question? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. But not about this. Um, yeah. Uh, do you know anything about like Gnosticism or mythicism or anything like that? The, what do you mean? Gnosticism as combated by the early Christians? Yeah. Well, agnostics, because they believed matter was evil, mm -hmm. the bodies were evil, so that true liberation, true salvation is that you be liberated from the body, and you'd continue to live as an immortal soul, okay. and that they believed that you had a pleroma, so that you had the, what they call the pleroma, where you have aeons, divinities, that would start from the top where you have this divinity, the monad, and from it, you had aeons, emanations. And as you got lower and lower on the rung, it was less divine than the emanation before it. So what about it? So, uh, no, I'm just, so just to give you a quick story. Uh, my dad was a Christian for, uh, a hardcore Christian for 30 years, served in the church, um, did all that stuff. Um, I actually was the one that was very away from Christ, didn't really know Christ. Um, through his turning, uh, he, he stopped because being a Christian, he lost his faith. Okay. Um, through his turning, it strengthened my faith and it set me out on this uh, path of, you know, finding who God is and, you know, started asking deeper questions and, um, and it ultimately led me to you, mm -hmm. um, which I want to, obviously, I want to thank you for. Yeah, thank you know, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, thank the Father, yes. thank the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son Almighty, the Holy Spirit. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, where I found you and you started strengthening my faith. Um, and, you know, I found you, then through you, I found Jay Dyer and then all these other apologists, David Wood, all these other guys, and really strengthened my faith, got me reading the early church. Uh, but okay. through his fall, he came on to Gnosticism and sure. believing in all this mysticism and the Bible is all allegorical. Um and it's just a big storybook to... According uh, to who? According to him. See, that's no, the thing. According to what authority that he get that from? Himself. Uh, he has no church. 
becomes his own still authority. So then yeah. you can't reason with a self-appointed pope, right? Yeah, that's that's true. Because I'd say, how do you know that the Bible is all allegorical? Who told you? Did the authors of the Bible tell you that? Well, he brings up that passage. I'm not me, Sam, but he brings up that passage in I believe Galatians, where where um, Paul calls on to Abraham um, as being allegorical uh, uh, allegory. So when Paul takes two historical figures in Genesis and he says that these two historical figures point to a greater reality. How does that prove that they are not historical figures? Because he didn't deny they're historical. Because if he had read the context, he affirms that Jesus is the seed of Abraham. And in Christ, we become the seed of Abraham. But if Abraham is an allegory, how can Jesus be the seed of an allegory? Why is he butchering Galatians 3 and 4? Well, then he would see he would come combat this with saying, well, Jesus is just an allegory. Um, so Paul is an allegory too. Yeah, you would say that they're written by ancient right. See, he's yeah. a yeah. Who are these ancient writers? And how does he know? He would say we don't know. Okay, so then you're basing everything on your assumption, and you have given me no evidence for your assumption. So how do you know Paul is an allegory? What's the historical evidence as an allegory? Yeah, he he would he would say that we have no proof for Paul. Other than so, the writings attributed, so you have no proof for Paul except the letter that you're quoting from Paul <laughs> to your position. Yeah, yeah, that's what he would say. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So why I've are you been... probably quoting Galatians for me? Because it's the letter says it's written by Paul, whom you don't know exists. So how do you know that you can trust this letter to tell you that Sarah and Hagar are allegorical? Yep, that's that's true. Kind of stupid, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's super stupid. I've been trying to get him out of this cult so following. You can't convince him. You can't argue him. Yeah. When a man becomes a, his self-appointed point and, and his own authority, yeah. you can't please him because he can't be proven false because he's the standard, right? Yep, that is true. Uh, yeah, no, you're right. So That's how do you part. reason and refute someone who thinks that he or she is the standard of truth? Yeah, <laughs> You really can't. So <laughs> yeah. Do I have time for one more question about? I don't know, man, because you were like the other guy. You just want attention from me. But go ahead. What is it? <laughs> okay, okay. This has to do with um Daniel 8, 14, about what the about cleansing it? of the sanctuary. What about it? So according to their interpretation, um, that when they believed that Jesus was going to return um, in 1844, was based off the time that Daniel gave in, in 8, 14. Yeah, that's. Uh, I don't care what they think because that's a 19th century interpretation. Yeah. Can you demonstrate historically Christians prior to the 19th century because they had to keep revising their prophecy. Miller kept making prophecies, and then when it didn't happen, he had to revise his prophecy just like Charles Stace Russell does. Can you show me anywhere in the early church history Christians understood Daniel 8.14 to refer to Christ? Ascending to cleanse the temple at a specific time in the distant future. I don't care what they say. Yeah. Well, do you know um, what Daniel eight fourteen is referring to? Whatever it's referring to, it's not referring to what Ellen G. White said. Okay. Well, Daniel A, because again, there's historical context that has an immediate fulfillment, and then it would have a long-range fulfillment because the figure in Daniel 8 is Antiochus, Epiphanes the fourth, who was the pagan ruler of Syria, who then entered into Jerusalem in 167 BC in December, slaughtered thousands of Jews, put a stop to the sacrifices in the temple, slaughtered a pig on the altar in order to desecrate the altar and defy God and built an altar to Zeus. So in its immediate fulfillment, it's referring to Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth, who rose to prominence in 167. B.C. in December. But Antiochus becomes a picture of the Antichrist. So there's an immediate fulfillment mm. fulfilled in 2nd century B.C. But then it has a longer range fulfillment because Antiochus becomes a picture of the Antichrist. Okay. That's it. Wow. And that, right. most of the events of Daniel 8 to 12 are referring to the Maccabees. If you actually study, yeah, one, that, that, that makes nine, sense. 10, 11, even 12 are pointing to most of those events were fulfilled during the Maccabean revolt where we get Hanukkah. In other words, Daniel's prophesying the miraculous victory 
of the Maccabeans in defeating Antiochus, the little horn, who rose to prominence, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, defeating him and his army, reclaiming the temple for the glory of God, where you get Hanukkah, which Jesus celebrated in John 10, 22, 23. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. But, like I said, there are things said about that little horn, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, that <clears throat> go beyond him and are waiting a greater fulfillment in the final Antichrist to come. For example, the abomination that makes desolate, mentioned in Daniel 9, 27. The abomination that makes desolate. And if you read, <clears throat> that would refer in its immediate context, refer in its immediate context to Antioch Antiochus entering the temple, defiling it, desecrating it by slaughtering a pig, right, build an altar to Zeus, but then the Lord Jesus takes that and applies it to the Roman army coming and destroying the temple because he takes Daniel 9, 27, and he applies it to the Romans, destroying the temple in 70 AD because the abomination that makes desolate is quoted by our Lord in Mark 13, 14, and Matthew 24, 15, and Luke 21, 20. Wow. I do have a question in regards to Isaiah, where he says, um, I know uh, the Orthodox and the uh, Roman Catholic faith does not hold to penal substitution. Yeah. So what is the interpretation of uh, being crushed? Yeah, because the Bible often ascribe language to God where God is doing something like in the case of Job chapter two, verse one or three. There it says that God tells Satan, you incited me against him to move against him. Okay, here, let's see this. So I can, let's see. Let me just show you. So, yes, I'm aware of this. This is a passage that's used. So, but here, let me show you how the language of Scripture works. Okay, language of Scripture. Somebody get me that? Okay. Job 2, verse 1 to 3. Let me enlarge the screen. Three. And again, it was the day that the sons of God came to stand before Yahweh. And Satan also came among them to stand himself before Yahweh. And Yahweh said to Satan, where do you come from? Then Satan answered Yahweh and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. Walking around on it. And Yahweh said to, Yahweh said to Satan, have you set your heart upon my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth. Send me that picture. And a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. And he still holds fast to his integrity. So he incited me against him to swallow him up in vain. So did God actually swallow him up? No. But he says he did, right? So let me show you. Let's now look at other translations as well. Okay. I'm going to show you how the Bible will ascribe to God an action that others do. But the reason why it's ascribed to God is because those actions could not take place if it wasn't God's will to bring it about here. Correct. Although you moved me against him to destroy him without cause. Did God really destroy Job? No. But he says he did. I got you. Kind of, like the, the Lord's uh, Daniel. Say it uh, again? Not Daniel, but David. When um, it says. Yes. Um, God okay. moved David, but then it says Satan, right? Okay, I got you. I got you. Okay, but so here, God did not destroy Job. Satan did. So when it says it pleased the Lord to crush him. That's because the servant would not have been crushed, would not have been crucified, would not have been handed over to death if it wasn't God's will. But that's not penal. It's not God pouring out his wrath. It's God in those circumstances bringing about the death of the servant by the hands of human agents. But it's not God pouring out his wrath. Okay. So it pleased the Lord to crush him. Well, how did he crush him? The same way he destroyed Job. So did he destroy Job? No. So then, did God destroy Jesus? No. no. This is the answer. So I know this is used for it doesn't support their case at all. But here, this is what it is. Acts 4, 27, 28. Here's the answer. For truly in this city... There were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. So it was your purpose 
and it was under your sovereign oversight, because Han means his power over all creation. You cannot move or breathe or act if it's not from God, because God sustains all things. God can constrain you or move you or permit you to do something. So what did they do? These rulers conspired to kill Jesus, but they could not do it if it wasn't within God's purpose for it to be done. So this doesn't teach penal substitutionary atonement. Okay, I agree. I, I can't. I can't refute that. I agree. And so I, I you know, I, I, because I used to believe that because I didn't know any, but I didn't know it was a modern novel interpretation only popularized and developed by reformed Christians. Because a lot of reformed Christians don't like to be called Calvinists, but be that as it may. Yeah, I, I've been reading through a uh, church history. Um, uh, I'm working slowly backwards to the early church fathers, but I've been reading through church history, and I see it's you know somewhat bloody, but that's we're sinful, so yeah. I can't contribute that to a yeah. certain denomination or anything like. I, you I, better I, believe it. Israel had its fair share of bloodshed and evil and morality, even though the priesthood, the temple, and the kingdom was established by God. But when you have corrupt men, evil men, sinful men. Assuming even God ordained offices, they will corrupt the good thing. And I also like to thank you because I used to curse the Catholic Church, and now I, I, my my spirit is fully convicted. I can't curse the Catholic Church. Okay. I really can't. The the church that God empowered and strengthened to combat heresy, and from having the West swallowed up by Islam, was the Catholic Church. Yeah, Some yeah. of the battles that pushed back the onslaught of Islam, uh, Islam were battles commissioned by the Catholic Church, the Battle of Lepanto, right, of Tours. There were no Protestants to stop the onslaught of Islam from swallowing up the West. It was the Catholic Church. So these Protestants who bashed the Catholics, it had not been for God using the Catholic Church, they would all have Muslim names and Muslim blood in their veins. Correct. And then to really add insult to injury, when the Protestant Reformation began, you have Reformed Protestants siding with the Turks, the Turkish Muslims, to try to destroy, to try to destroy the Catholic Church. Yeah, I've read a lot of that, and so it's like even for the life of me, I used to like try to evangelize Catholics, and now I'm just like I just want to make sure the Catholics I speak to are not traditional Catholics, but actually Catholics who know their faith. Yeah, I mean cultural Catholics, because yeah, when you call, Catholic. you say the Catholic, traditional Catholic, they means that they go with like old Latin, you know, Latin mass and so on. You mean cultural Catholics? Yeah, my apologies for misspeaking. Yeah. No, I understand. But and what's stopping you from just looking towards the ancient churches? What's stopping me is my conscience. So um, I, I've read through, and I've uh, I've read through some of the early church fathers how they believe baptism was uh through regeneration yes, and yeah. they for instance the um some of the developments with uh mary because i know how the eastern orthodox speaks about it because i've been doing a deep research in yeah, yes. eastern orthodox yeah, they don't believe they don't have the augustinian view of original sin which is original guilt so yeah. you're born corrupted and tainted right uh the orthodox church their view would be more akin and the orthodox are here they can better represent the position Right. That we receive a sinful bent, but we are not sinful and we're not born guilty and condemned. But later on, as we mature and attain cognition, we're aware of our existence and aware of choices. That's when we are held responsible. That's when that sinful bent arises to move us to sin. But if you ask the Catholics, do they believe? If you ask the Catholics, do they believe that Mary was kept pure from actual sin? Yes. If you ask them, you say, Catholics, do you believe Mary sinned in her life? No. Did the Lord work in her in such a way by the grace procured by her son that she never sinned? Yes. Here, the Orthodox are here asking. So I'm, I don't want to speak for them. They can speak for themselves better than I can. If you ask the Orthodox, did Mary ever commit personal sin? Ever. Absolutely not. That's why she's called Panagia, all holy. By the graces of her son. So though Catholics and Orthodox may disagree on the nature of original sin and 
what that entails and whether Mary had to be kept pure from conception. They both agree she was kept from any personal sin. She never committed any sin. Where did they get this from? Because if you go back in the early church, you'll see that she was believed to be the new Eve and she undid the sin of Eve and she was the ark that gave to Christ the fullness of his human nature. For example, if I were to ask you, if you believe the earthly tabernacle is a shadow of the heavenly one, which it is, and if you go to Hebrews 8 and you read verses 4 to 5, the earthly tabernacle is a shadow of the true tabernacle not made by human hands. And if you go to Hebrews 9, and if you read 23 to 28, it says Christ entered the true tabernacle, not made by human hands. So the earthly one is a shadow of the heavenly one. So just like on earth, so it is in heaven. As it is in heaven, may it be on earth. So you have the heavenly tabernacle, you have the holy place, the altar, and you have the most holy place, which is the mercy seat, or the throne of God. So on earth, you have the tabernacle, you have the holy place, you have the veil, you have the most holy, holy of holies, and behind the veil, the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, which represents God's throne, and behind the veil, you have the tablets of stone, where God wrote the laws for Moses with his finger, the golden jar of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. Now, if you read Leviticus 16, so I'm going to ask you a question. First it was the tabernacle, then the temple. Because first they had a tabernacle, a movable, portable tabernacle, then the temple in Jerusalem. The high priest could only enter the most holy place once a year. And he had to do so at his own peril and risk. But first he had to make sacrifice, sacrificeable for him and his family. If it was accepted, then he'd have to go back and bring in the blood of the goat that was slaughtered into the most holy place. And if God accepted it, he'd come out alive. But he couldn't remain there, and he'd have to enter after strict purification, washing, changing his clothes, et cetera, et cetera. And that's just the earthly tabernacle, which is a shadow of the heavenly one. In heaven, you have the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. You have the throne. God the Father appearing visibly, visibly on a throne. Christ in his glorified physical body of flesh right there in the heavens of heaven, seeing God the Father's visible glory, seeing the Son of God in his glorified physical body of flesh, and no one can remain there who is sinful because if you're sinful, you have to leave. Now, if the earthly tabernacle was so strict in that the high priest could only enter once a year and make sure that he made purification so he could be pure enough to enter once a year and then immediately leave, how much more do you assume that those in heaven were beholding the actual throne and seeing God in his visible glory in Christ? How much more pure and holy must they be to remain permanently before him? They have to be sinless, right? Yeah, from the reasoning that you're giving, yes. Well, I mean, think about it. The earthly one, could he enter sinful? No. What would happen to him if he did? He died. It says over because he died. Yeah. He died, right? Mm -hmm. And tradition says they would tie a rope to his ankle in case he dropped dead because no one could go after him because they died too, right? Correct. So then here's my question to Protestants. If you could not enter the shadow, the mercy seat, which is the shadow of the throne in heaven, unless you're absolutely pure and then you have to leave, how did Mary contain... All the fullness of God, God Almighty in his fullness, in her womb, if she was capable of sinning throughout that entire period. My natural instinct would just say it's flesh, Christ's flesh in the womb. Yeah, but the high priest had flesh and he still couldn't enter unless he was completely pure enough to enter once a year and then he had to leave. Oh, so I, I see the picture you're painting. You're saying, say, for instance, the... Um, temple in and of itself is mary then the inner sanctuary of jesus physical body he says it's a temple of god destroy this temple i raise it up in three days right his physical body correct but that physical body was taken from whom mary 
So my question is, if he's God in all his fullness and he's tabernacling in her womb, could she have sinned for a second containing God in all his fullness for that entire period that she conceived him? You know the answer. You're no, 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 no. I, my lawyer just had a brain fart. So, sorry. Hit, hit me one more time. My apologies. If you cannot sin for even a moment and be in the God's presence without incurring his wrath, how did Mary contain God in all his fullness, in the fullness of deity, in her womb for the entire period, if she was capable of sinning or she actually sinned? She had to be sinless. I see yeah, yeah. She had to be sinless. We got it. So that means now you're one step closer to the ancient teaching of the of the fathers, which are the same teachings in the Orthodox Catholic Church. So that means at least for that entire period, she had to have been sinless. But then they say, well, hold on. Since God deliberately created her to be the vessel from which Christ would take flesh, why would it be a stretch of imagination that Christ in his grace saved her from ever actually sinning because she was prepared for that honor of giving to him his flesh, which would be the temple of God. Oh, okay. I see. You understand? So impl implying um, kind of like uh, how they, they, they sanctified the temple prior to, Ah, I got you. Know, so the Christians understood, hmm, if Christ's physical body is the temple of God, and he took that flesh from Mary. That means when he was in Mary, she was the temple that housed God. But no unclean thing can touch God. So how could she at any moment have sinned when God was dwelling in all his fullness in her womb? That's how they reasoned. They were right. Because they looked at the earthly time and I come and looked at the heavenly temple. Wow. Thy priest could only enter once a year in the most holy place. And he had to be absolutely pure. Because if there was any stain of sin, right, on his part, and if the sacrament defected, he'd be killed dead. How could then Mary contain God in his fullness in her belly if she even sinned for a second? Mm -hmm. right? um, out of curiosity, which early church father wrote that? Because I'd like to go read it. The early church fathers that spoke of her being the new Eve and the Ark of the Covenant. Yes, sir. So, I mean, there are many, but I got to find my articles for you. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to. Um... No, no, I know. Yeah, I'm just, but that's what I'm saying. So if you if you type it in, let me go to my blog, that she's the new Eve and she's the Ark of the Covenant. Because I, so I right. what, when she says, um, when what Christ is, is saying son. Um, Say it again. I can't hear you. Uh, sorry. When reference to the cross, when he's on the cross, he says uh, woman. Yep, that's right. That's I just did a talk on it earlier. It's that's the allusion to Genesis three. Yes, so I, I see the allusions. So yes. I'm I'm just trying to figure out what's the extent of the allusions that are being brought forth from the Old Testament. Because I just did like open air, uh, I just did open air preaching today off of marriage and how the illusion of marriage and walking with Christ and mm -hmm. you shouldn't say friends get angry with your wife due to the fact the anger was already dealt with on the cross. Say it again, because I'm not saying the connection you're making as I'm trying to find you the article. Sorry. So say for instance, when, um, when a husband, so you, you see as Paul in Ephesians chapter five, he says, husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church, willing to give up yourself for her. And this is a great mystery that's being, uh, that's that Paul's saying. So when I was preaching over marriage, um, I shouldn't say, for instance, get angry with my wife or say, for instance, uh, show my wrath towards my wife mm -hmm. when that anger towards sin was already dealt with in Christ. So the sinful anger, which Christ was speaking about on the Sermon on the Mount, this anger, I shouldn't well, be. Yeah, I'm trying to see the connection with Mary because I don't know where you're going with oh, this. Oh, no, 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 no. This is not this is not a reference to Mary. My apologies. This is, I'm just hey, talking. So you're confused because Christ and the church are prefigured by Adam and Eve. Correct. So I'm trying to say what's the, what's the connection. Because in Genesis 2.24, it says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Correct. Ephesians 5.30 to 32, Paul says that this is actually about Christ and the church. He says that was meant to be a picture of Christ in the church. 
So from the beginning, Adam and Eve were designed to prefigure, foreshadow Christ and the church because Christ is the last Adam and his bride would be the last Eve. That would be the church. But the church is undergoing purification and glorification and sanctification. So just like Eve had the propensity to sin due to the serpent's cunning, Paul warns the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 11, 1, 4, that he fears for them that they will lose their virginity by the seduction of the serpent. Just like the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, you too may be deceived from your <clears throat> devotion, belief, and faith in the simplicity of the gospel of Christ. So according to Paul, Adam and Eve were designed to be a picture of Christ in the church. So though Adam and Eve exist, and they're actual historical persons, they were designed to point to a greater reality because it all points to Christ. And that's why he says in Ephesians 5, 30 to 32, he quotes Genesis 2, 24 and Ephesians 5, 31. He goes, and lo, I speak of a mystery. I speak of Christ in the church. He's saying that is actually about Christ in the church. Now, how many marriages took place in the garden? Now, by the way, everyone got the article that I sent you about Mary as a new Eve. It's right there. I sent it in the scripture box. How many marriages took place in the garden? Only one. How many? One. How many will take place in the new garden? One. Yep. Christ and the church, which is personified in heavenly Jerusalem, the city coming down as a bride prepared for her husband. Bro, I can't even cap on that. That's actually real good. Yeah. I mean, I've done sessions on Jesus in the Garden of Eden, and I went through this painstakingly meticulously i think it was what eight parts but if you actually break down genesis chapter two and three you're going to see it's all about christ it's all about christ i mean adam is real eve is real but they're pointing to christ they're pointing to the church but by extension it's also pointing to the woman who gives birth to the seed that crushes the head of the serpent now that seed is not just messiah the seed is christ in union with believers who make up his spiritual body so when it says the seed of the woman, you will bruise his heel and he'll crush your head. So if you go oh, to Luke, spiritual offspring. Yep. If you go to Luke 10, 17 and 20 and Romans 16, 20, that seed that will crush the devil under his feet is said to be the church. The believers who in union with Christ by the power of Christ are now empowered to crush the serpent under their feet. But then the question is, who's the woman? In that context, we know it's Eve, but Eve becomes a picture of a greater reality. How do we know? Because as you read the Old Testament narrative, as it unfolds and culminates in the New Testament, Eve becomes a picture of Israel. But then Israel is typified, personified in Mary. It's very deep. So Eve goes from being a picture of Israel because that is the woman, the bride of God, but then Israel is typified, personified it's in copy Mary. and paste. Say it again. It's copy and paste. I, I don't know if I would say copy and paste, but meaning well, no, yeah. Yeah. So I'm saying, like, say for instance, you'll you'll have Genesis, and then, as you say, the um, the children of Israel. Then you have Christ, the cross. Then you paste that same picture in as well. So the church, the offspring, which is representing the church. And so you have Eve, who's a picture of Israel, who then becomes typified, personified Mary. But then also Israel is now fulfilled in the church of Christ because that's true Israel. So it's multi-layered. It's not, it's not one person and it's not just foreshadowing one entity. There are multiple, multiple layers of meaning and entities that are all <clears throat> subsumed in that imagery. So the woman, Eve. But then it points to Israel, which is then typified in Mary, which is also the church, because the church is true Israel and therefore the greater Eve. Yeah, this is one of the reasons why I had to get rid of dispensationalism. Yep. But I, I sent you the article about where they came with the assumption, all right, if Christ is the temple of God and the temple of God cannot be defiled or tainted by sin, this is why even in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, when we're told we are the spiritual temple of God and God's spirit lives on us, but then we're warned, 
God destroys those who destroy the temple. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 to 20, you're warned that as the temple of God, God's spirit lives in you. If you defy yourself and do not repent, you will be destroyed because God's temple cannot be contaminated. That's why he put those to sleep who were taking communion. Yes. So now if we go back to Mary and she's containing God and all his fullness in her womb. So God is now becoming flesh, becoming physical, becoming human. And he's truly residing in her womb in all his fullness and truly becoming flesh from her. At what moment during that entire pregnancy would she sin or be allowed to sin and capable of sinning? Because you cannot have God in all his fullness tabernacling within her with a stain of sin, a taint of sin. If you could not even enter the earthly tabernacle, the most holy place, with sin, and you cannot dwell in the heavenly tabernacle and stand before the visible throne of God and behold the visible glory of God with sin, because you'd be expelled, then what about Mary? That's the point I'm trying to make.